Thank you for listening to Liberty Christian Center's podcast. Let's join Pastor Paul Carlson for today's message. All right, so we're going to go ahead and get into the Word this morning. Doing a series, we call it Bought Back. Bought Back, and basically this is what we're talking about, is that we have a covenant with the Most High God. He's delivered us, He's freed us, through Jesus and what Jesus did for us, I'm telling you what, he's brought us to a place where we can live and enjoy life. Um, you know, I'm a different kind of preacher, you know, and there's all kinds. You know, I meet with pastors here in Menominee, and we have coffee, and, and I, it's a great thing, and we talk, and I know friends that are pastors, and people approach it all different ways. You know, sometimes I have a couple uncles that were both pastors and in heaven now. And uh, my aunt, who lives in California, when we go out there, we always talk with her. And she's told me good stories. She's such a good storyteller. And I've tried to record her telling stories, but she caught on that I was filming and she got mad at me. So I couldn't do it anymore. Although I do have them in my archive somewhere in the cloud, in the cloud. But um, she said that, that my uncles used to actually memorize every word they were going to say, which is cool. Man, tell you, hats off. I, that would freak me out. That would freak me out to memorize. I mean, you know, I love, I love being part of weddings and seeing these couples, but probably the hardest thing for me is reading a script and, and, and uh, standing in one spot. Imagine that. That can be tough. Can't get the bride and groom to walk with me as I pace. <laughs> they got to do a sidestep, do some kind of Michael Jackson move or something. I, you know, we could try that sometime, huh? Anyway, but uh, I, I am more of an inspirational minister, I mean, you know, and I basically, you know, ask God what direction to go, and I have notes, and you know, I keep my iPad up there just to try to keep me on a, a course, but I, I believe God for what I would call unction. Is that a religious word, unction? What I, yeah, it is. It is a religious word. I'm going to use unction before they were born again. Yeah, you know, I was, who was that? No. <laughs> but basically, I, I'm looking for the Holy Spirit. I'm looking for a road to go down with him. And you know what my goal is? Is to go down a road with him and that all of us go there too. You hear me? And frankly, what I say to you isn't nearly as important as what the Holy Spirit says to you, okay? You see, we work together, and, and um, what I believe for is this, that, that he'll take things that, that even I would say, and he'll take them and have impact to you. He'll take things, you know, and just show you things that you need to know. Because, you know, you look around here, there's just different, we're all different. We have different needs. Not everybody has the same needs that I have and Dana has. You know, not everybody is babysitting their grand dog these next two weeks. You know, but we are. We need Holy Ghost to show us how to temper the little guy. And anyway, not spoil him too much and all that. But, but you know what? You have needs. And... Holy Spirit knows what those things are. And it's just so amazing to me how he'll take things and he'll just make them make sense to you, you know? You know, and sometimes people say, oh, that was a really good message. And I'm thinking, I don't think it was that great. But what I know happened is this, that the Holy Spirit takes things and he shows them to you because you have a hungry heart. Can you say hungry? hungry. Say, that's me. You see, your hunger... Your hunger, what kind of hunger? I'm not talking about hungry for the roast beef today, but your hungry, hunger spiritually is a powerful thing. And it'll go and it'll reach into heaven's realm and it'll pull things into your realm that you need right here and now. Wow. You know, I, I remember just as a, as a baby Christian, you know, the guy that, that was instrumental in leading me to Christ he took me around to every church in Minneapolis because that's where I lived and just wanted me to, to get an experience and, and, and see the different flavors that were out there, okay? And I remember coming out of a, a big church in downtown Minneapolis. Actually, it wasn't downtown at that point. Later, it moved to downtown, but it was over in South Minneapolis. And we walked out, 
And the Holy Spirit had just, just spoke to me during the message. And I was just like, like this, you know what? I love having newbie Christians around. You know, you know what I'm saying? You know, because they just, everything that happens, they go, wow. And that's how I was. I was like, wow, I had the big eyes. I'm like, wow, can you believe that, that God just, he knew what I was going through and he spoke to me. And, and the guy that brought me, he goes, well, you know what? That's how Holy Spirit works. And he said he was probably telling different things to everybody in there, but it was things they needed. Isn't that amazing how he does that? He takes things, he knows you. He knows you that you're up here from Florida, Cliff and Sharon, good to see you. And, and, you know, he knows things you need today. And he's going to speak to you and show you things that, that are important to you. You know, it's, it's so good. That's why it's great to work with the Word and great to work with Holy Spirit and, and just follow the trail that, that we're going to go. We kind of, I approach ministry kind of like we, we've approached prayer meetings for years. You know, Dana and I, Dana leads prayer now. And... Um, at the church, but for years we used to do it in our, our living room, and we would we would have people over every Wednesday night, and and uh, we'd we'd just pray and seek God and whatever you know, and say, "What'd you pray about?" Well, that's interesting, because what we would endeavor to do is not to come up with a big prayer list, but we would endeavor to do is find how to tap into what the Spirit of God wanted us to do, and then pray that way. You know, so I mean, you know, do you pray for the government? Sure. It's scriptural to pray for the government. Do you pray for the Philippines? Sure. It's scriptural to pray for the Philippines. But, but the biggest thing would be is just to tap it, to get yourself in a place where you can hear heaven and follow that trail. That's what's good. Frankly, that's how I do life. <laughs> that's how I do. I do life the same way I do preaching, you know. I, I, I don't have, to have everything figured out. I wish I did. I try to, try to think of things. But the biggest thing, the most important thing to me is to keep my antenna up and hear Holy Spirit and follow him. And, and that is not flaky, my dear friends. That is not flaky. Can it be? People can get flaky. Anytime you got people involved with anything, it can be flaky. But what I'm talking about is true Christianity true Christianity, not just knowing about God, actually knowing God, actually knowing him. You mean you can know God? Yeah, you can know God. He can be real to you. He can be as real to you as your best friend. He can be as real to you as your husband or wife. You can know his voice to such a measure, and I'm working on it. I, I haven't arrived, but you can know his voice, you know, in, in any situation, and know what to do and where to go. Now, again, I haven't arrived, but I got something before me. I got a goal before me is to know him better. Yeah. All right, so we're doing this series. We call it Bought Back. We're talking about Jesus, we're talking about our covenant. The inspiration that, that um, I went with in the beginning, I'll, I'll read you these couple verses. It's Hebrews 12, basically verse 2. It says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Aren't you glad he's not just the author, but he's the finisher? Yeah. It's one thing to start out following God, but it's another thing to finish your course. The Bible talks about, you know, Paul talked about it. You know, the apostle Paul, he said at the end of his life, he said, I've run my race and I've finished my course. Don't just, you know, it's good to get started but don't just have starting your goal. Have your goal be that I'm finishing my course. Don't check out early. Hear me? Don't check out early, but finish your course. So Jesus, it says that he's the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and was sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Isn't that amazing? For the joy that was set before him, he, he went through. Anybody ever see the passion? You, you know? Mel Gibson, Dana would not go. I had to go with somebody else to that movie. We sat, sat in the front row with a bunch of people from church back then and watched it because I wasn't going to miss out on what everybody was seeing. That was a great time when that movie was in the theaters because it was an open door to talk to people. You know, I actually uh, witnessed to the usher one time. Actually, another time, Dana and I were going to a movie, but they were showing The Passion, and, and I, I went and sat in my seat 
with Dana because I like to get to movies early. You know, anybody like that? I've got to be there before the lion roars. I want to be there and actually see the, the, the previews, you know, because it's my, my chill time. So Dana and I, we got our Cokes. Back then we drank Coke. And we, we went and sat down in our seats. And I said, boy, I need to go back. I need to go back to the guy that was taking our tickets. What's that? Well, it's Holy Spirit talking to me. He was t- speaking to my heart. He, I says, I'm going back and talk to that gentleman that was taking our ticket stubs. And so Dana, Dana held our seats, because that's important when you're going to a movie. Keep your seats you know, covered and all that, unless you get got Fandango. But, um, but anyway, so I went back, and I just said to him, I said, hey, say, you get, people can come and see that movie, The Passion? And he goes, yeah, it's incredible, man. Big lines, everything, coming to see this. I said, you know what it's about? I just started talking to him about Jesus. Told him about the gospel. See, it's open doors. Open doors, following God. What were we talking about? Oh, the passion. So you ever see that movie? Jesus endured all that and more. I mean, that only showed a part of what Jesus went through, but he did it because of you. You were the joy. Say, I'm the joy that was set before Jesus. He said, I can do it for them because you are important. You're worth it. Then in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, there's a scripture the Apostle Paul uh, voiced here and penned. He said this, he said, therefore, my beloved brethren, who's he talking to? He's talking to the church. He's talking to people like you and me. He said, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So what, is, what does that have to do with anything? Well, when I, when I was preparing for this message or praying about it, that was the inspiration that came to me because it's the picture I want to have of what God's doing in our hearts steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. I'll say this, that, that um, if you've wavered, dig your, deeps, dig your roots deep into the covenant you have with Jesus, okay? If you found yourself wavering in life, go back and say, hey, I'm a child of the Most High God. I've been bought with the price of, of Jesus' own blood. I've been purchased. I'm redeemed. I've been set free in Jesus' name. You see, this brings stability in your life. In this crazy world we live in, you and I can be secure. We can be stable. It's not that we love all the craziness of the world, but we've got something greater. It's Jesus and what he did for us. Are you with me? Amen. Three of you are with me. I'm glad. Glad. Come on, guys. Come on. We're going. <sighs> All right. So I, I, I got a couple stories, but before I go there, I want to just share this, this, this thing that, that has been real to Dana and I. You know, the things I talk to you guys about are things that basically we've practiced in our life, and they're real to us. And we don't have all the answers, but we're going in the right direction, I believe. And, and so that's what we're sharing. We've, we've done this thing for many years, and we'd call it pleading the blood, okay? Pleading the blood. Now, that is such a crazy phrase when I think about it. One, it's full of Christianese, pleading the blood. There's not one time I remember, you know, back when I was hanging out, doing stupid things, that I ever stood up in the crowd and says, I'm going to plead the blood right now. Had I done that... They might have really thought I was nuts. And if you do this, if you just stand up in Walmart today in aisle 12 by the Lay's potato chips and say, I'm pleading the blood, they probably will call for the manager and security and say, there's a lunatic in aisle 12 doing something over these chips that involves blood, you know, and that wouldn't be good. Be wise as a Christian. Don't just, you know, throw things out there that, that people won't understand. But be, you know, you can be wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. Okay, that's what Jesus said. So anyway, this term called pleading the blood, there's, here's the other thing about it. Pleading can have the, the connotation that you're like begging for something. And can I say something? Not. That's not what I'm talking about. Pleading, when, I'm, when I use this term, I'm not talking about begging God to do something, okay? I'm not begging God to do something because the truth is he's already done this. 
I'm simply declaring what God has already done, okay? Pleading the blood is more of a legal term. It's a legal term, just like if you were in a court of law and you did what they call, I plead the fifth. Now, I'm not a lawyer, but I grew up watching Perry Mason and different shows like that. Somebody says, who's Perry Mason? Well, ask me later. But, but uh, I know this, that when people plead the fifth, what they're saying is, I'm calling attention to a right that I have. I'm calling attention to something that belongs to me. I don't have to speak in this court, except I'm saying this, I plead the fifth. So when I plead the blood, I'm drawing attention to something that belongs to me. I'm drawing attention to the blood of Jesus that was shed for me, and it's upon that which I stand right now, and that makes me stable and secure. A couple places in the Bible, it uses this kind of talk in Psalm 43, 1. It says, vindicate me, O God, and plead my cause against an ungodly nation. Deliver me from the deceitful and unjust man. Another one is Isaiah 3, 13. It says, Lord, the Lord stands up to plead and stands to judge the people. So again, in these, these, the context here, it's where it's like a legal thing. And that, that he's pleading a cause or declaring a cause. He's, he's de- I, I like the word declare. And what I could say is I declare the blood of Jesus is over my life. When do you do this kind of stuff? Well, I'll go the same way I did in the first service. As a parent, okay? As a parent, you may do this. Well, one, you might do it for yourself. You know, sometimes when, you know, Dana and I are having adventures, you know, in life and we're going down a trail or, you know, we're driving our car through Iowa and there's a snowstorm that hits. That's happened to us more than once that's happened to us. And, uh, you know, we we pull over the side of the road because we can't see where we're going. I'm actually describing a scene. And and we're we're sitting on 35W on on the side of the road because we couldn't see where the road was. And I'm waiting for a, a truck to come by so I can follow the tail. Anybody else know that trick? And we're sitting there, and we see a truck in the rearview mirror. And, and the next thing I had to do was I had to grab Dana because she tried to run out the passenger door and jump in the ditch because she thought the truck was going to hit us. And I said, no! I grabbed her and pulled her back in the car. <laughs> it's so fun to live with Dana. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 you know, that would be a time you'd say, hey, I, I plead the blood. I plead the blood over us. Well, the truck went by us. We got behind it, followed its lights until we got to an exit, and we found a hotel. One of the last places we could find, uh, they were just filling up like crazy because nobody could drive. But pleading the blood. As a parent, you might plead the blood. It's such a joy to be a parent. And, And, you know, you get these little babies, you bring them home from the hospital, you know, and, and you, know, you don't really have a clue, but you trust in God, and you're, you're calling on him. You know, I think I prayed more as a new parent than any time in my life. You know, when you're up in the middle of the night, you know, and I'm praying God help me to help this kid, you know, and, and whatever. I won't go in too far, but, but you know, there's different stages as a, as a parent with, with children. You know, the first six months, they're just, you know, they're, they're spitting up and doing baby things. And, and then, then, then it gets to a point where, you know, you, you, t- you totally have control over them, though. You know, if you take them and you put them in the crib, they're going to stay in the crib until you t- pick them up and take them out. But then they begin to, to do things like crawl. And, you know, I remember the first time Kara ever crawled. You know, it was, it was before I went to work one morning. She crawled from one end of the house to the other. And I was like, wow, all right, she can crawl. It's so good. But then I found out that the fact that she can crawl meant that now when I put her somewhere, she might end up on the other end of the house, and I don't know where she's even at because I didn't have as much control anymore because she was crawling. And then before you know it, they're taking that first step, and they're walking, you know? It seems like it goes that quick anyway. And all of a sudden, they're taking these steps. They're walking around the furniture, but then they make the big move where they let go of everything, and they take a couple steps, and they fall. And, you know, you get so excited, you grab the camera, you call everybody in the house, you say, hey, look at they're walking. But you don't realize it opens up another whole new world 
because now they're like unlimited in where they can go. You're at a mall and you let go of their hand for a minute and they could be over, you know, in, in the, the automotive place instead of in the, the clothing place or whatever. Well, it continues to go on and I'm going to jump several years ahead and all of a sudden you're beginning to teach them how to drive. This day is coming. Anyway, but in any case, you teach them how to, how to drive. And, and I always took my girls, you know, like to, you know, Downsville or something. We drove around and, you know, taught them how to park and do all that kind of thing. And went by the old galley cheese factory on our route, you know, in the, in the driver's school. But then there comes this next time where they get their license. And they're coming to you and they're asking you for the keys to the car. They're not just going to walk around the house. They're going to actually leave the house in a motor vehicle. And this, parents, is when you plead the blood. Okay? You say, thank you, Father. I, I, I release them into your care. I release them to your charge, and I hold the blood up that's been shed for them. When, when our baby, Casey, you know, I don't know how old she was, but, but you know, they're always your babies. I don't care how old, if, they're, if they get to be 50 and I'm around, they're my babies, you know. And, and uh, she, she moved to New York, and it was such a challenge for a, uh, from, from a parental side, you know, to let your baby go to this big city and let them out of your control. And so the first few weeks being in New York, you know, we'd get these random calls, and it got to a point where I said, you can never call your mom. You must call me. You must call. In fact, if she called mom, the practice was is Dana saw it ringing and she would give it to me and I would answer it and say, all right, dad here, what's up? And more than once this happened that she was in New York City and she was trying to go to work or somewhere and she got on the wrong subway and ended up in, would say, the wrong end of the town. If there's a wrong or right end, I don't know, but, but it seemed like it wasn't the right end. And so she would call me, and she'd say, Dad, I'm lost. I don't know where to go. Tell me where to go. See, she's grown up being used to calling me if she's in Minneapolis or St. Paul and saying, where, where do I go? And I'm pretty good with those cities. I know where they are. But we're talking New York. I said, Casey, I have no idea where you're going. Now, at this point in our home, she's in New York. Dane and I are in Menominee. I'm talking on the phone. Dana's on the sidelines hearing all this. At this point, I'm saying, Dana, go downstairs. And what we'd do is we'd send, I wasn't punishing Dana, no. But we'd, we'd have Dana go downstairs so she couldn't hear anymore, and she would pray. Because it was too much information for her mind to have peace. And she would just, she was going she was going ballistic down there. It was just like, and she was telling God, how do I even deal with this? How do I even live life, you know, and, and, and be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord? There's times in life when life is happening to you, you got to find a way to get a hold of God. you got to find that root, that, that way to grab onto him, because can I tell you another secret? There's really no pat answers to life. There's no pat answers in applying God to your life. I mean, I could say this is a pat answer. Jesus is Lord, okay? But I can't tell you, go say Jesus is Lord 50 times and think your problem's going to go away. The pat answer, if there was one at all, is in any situation, you need to find God. You need to tap into him. You need to get a connection with him and bring life to your religion. It's like, well, let me tell you this. What, what God finally said to Dana is, is, um, this is, this is the word that set her free. He said to Dana, he said, she's never alone. She's never alone. I mean, there were other things, but I'm trying not to tell every bit of the story. She had a dream, and different things happened. But God basically said to her, your, your baby, Casey, is never alone. Now, you know what? I could say that to you this morning. You're never alone. You're never alone. Your kids are never alone. God's with them. Even when they might, they might be running from God, I'll tell you what, he's there. 
I know when I ran from God, I look back, I can see points where God was just showing up so strong. I mean, you've heard me before. I was running from God so bad, I called my dad and said, Dad, quit praying for me. Quit praying for me. And not only that, I want you to call Uncle Carl, tell him to quit praying, and I want you to call Aunt Norty, was another person. I said, hey, call them and tell them to stop praying for me. It's driving me nuts. And I was so naive, I didn't realize that in dad talk, that meant turn it up. <laughs> it wasn't long until I came to the end of my rope, and I said, God, I need you, okay? All right, where are we at? Well, we're talking about having a connection. We're talking about the reality of life. We're talking about pleading the blood, you know. So, so you know what? We learned to plead the blood when our kid moved to New York. We'd say, hey, we hold it up. Thank you that we're not there, but you're there. We're in covenant with God. She's in covenant with God. Protect her. I could sit here now for at least an hour and tell you stories of how God delivered her from really bad situations just because she was a naive Wisconsin girl walking around in New York for years. <laughs> she wasn't so naive after a year or so. She was pretty savvy, but... Uh, Tell you what, you need his protection in every, every situation. Revelation chapter 12. Revelation, I'm just talking for a few minutes about pleading the blood. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, it says this. It says, so the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. You know, that's one of the things the devil does is he deceives people. He makes people think one thing, and the truth is something else. Deception. So he, he deceives the whole world, and he was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Verse 10 says, Then I heard a loud voice in heaven, saying, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. Get this, for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. So the, another thing the devil is, is the accuser. He's the accuser of the brethren. And what he accuses of, us of before the throne, I'm telling you what, it rings in your ears. Okay? You know, as you're going through life and as you're following the plan of God for you, Hearing heaven, hearing, you know, words of Jesus. I mean, just like what I said when God spoke to Dana and said, she's never alone. I mean, I could say that to Dana. I could say that to me. And it only has so much impact. But when God says that to you, I'm telling you, go to the bank with it. It does not mean you'll never be challenged in life. What it does mean is when you are challenged, you bring that up and say, God said he spoke this to my heart. These are words that bring freedom to you, okay? So the devil is, is a deceiver, and he's an accuser who stands before God day and night, and like I said, he rings in your ears these same accusations. What does he say? He says, you're never going to make it. He says, you thought it was hard last time? You're never going to succeed this time. He says, you, you know, you're not good enough. It's a, he says, everybody else has it together, but let me tell you, you don't. You ever been driving your car on a windy day? Anybody? I'm sure you have. You live, live where I do. You drive your car on a windy day, and you're going down Highway or Interstate 94. And, you know, sometimes, I'm, I, I, again, I can remember driving through Iowa on windy days. What is it with Iowa, Jody? I don't know. But they even have windmills out on the, out on the, high, on the interstate. And, but I, I remember driving through that, and the wind just whipping, and I'm feeling like, man, this is a struggle to even keep my car on the road. And I look around at the other cars around me, and it doesn't look like anybody there is having any problem. They all look like they've got it together. But I am fighting. I am struggling to stay on the road. But if you could hear inside the cars, certainly if you could hear inside the heads of the other people on that road, you realize this, they're fighting the same battle you are. 
all right? You are not alone. You're not alone in life. And the battles that come to you, they come to everybody. But the devil is an accuser, and he'll stand before God. He'll stand in between your ears and talk to you, and he'll tell you, you're not going to make it. You're not good enough. What you're going through, nobody's ever gone through. Those are words of the devil. You hear me? What you're going through, I'm telling you, it's not another human being that's ever lived, that's ever dealt with what you're... The things that you and I go through are common to man. They're common to man. And if you buy that lie that what you have is unique, well, you've got to get rid of that lie to go on, okay? Verse 11, going on, same context, says, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, and they didn't love their lives even to the death. So when thoughts are ringing in your ear telling you, one, you're not going to make it, telling you you're no good, telling you that you'll never measure up, okay, the strategy you need to take is not to stand up to those things and say, yes, I will. I, I, I'm a good person. I'm a good person. Do you know I went to Liberty Christian Center this week? I've been in church. I even took communion. That stuff will not win the battle for you. Having that argument will not win the battle you're in. But standing up and saying, hey, <laughs> who am I except somebody that God loves and Jesus shed his blood for? I don't stand on what I've done, but I stand on the blood of Jesus. That'll break you through. That'll get you through to the other side. You and I have what we call covenant with the Most High God. Covenant is a strong term. It's one that's probably not used today like it maybe has been in other days, but it's like an unbreakable contract, and we have it with him, and it's been established by Jesus' very own blood. Isaiah 43, it says this too in verse 25. It says, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Put me in remembrance and let us contend, or I could say let us plead together. State your case that you may be acquitted. God's not remembering your past failures. He's not remembering some great sin. In fact, in his mind, it's been settled all because of Jesus' blood. I'm going to tell you two quick stories in the time we have remaining. First one is, a, is a, about a man named Cornelius. You'll find this story in Acts chapter 10. Cornelius was a, a, a good man, um, and, he, and he really, he, he loved God, but he didn't have much information about God. What you need to know about Cornelius is that he was a Gentile. What is a Gentile, you might say? Well, a Gentile in the Old Testament, was anybody that wasn't in covenant with God. You know, in our day, it would be the same thing. But, but basically, Cornelius, it says he was an Italian. He was of the Italian band. So God bless the Italians, right? And, and um, Cornelius was a guy, though, whose heart was set on God, even though he didn't know everything. He didn't know how to do things right. He didn't know about Jesus. He didn't know how to enter into a relationship with God, but his heart was hungry for God. He wanted this stuff. I've, I've brought this up to people before who have come and asked me the, 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 the big question, what, you know, God, if God's good and, and, you know, he loves everybody, what about those people in the remote countries that have never heard the gospel? Well, what I would say to you, in a nutshell, is that if a person's heart is hungry towards God, God will move heaven and earth to get the message to them. And, it, and that's how it was with Cornelius. He was a good man, and he, was, he got heaven's attention, so much so that an angel came and visited Cornelius. Isn't that incredible? You know, that'd be all right to have an angel come and talk to you and tell you a few things. Yeah, it'd be all right. I don't go seeking that, but, but you know, good day, Cornelius. I'm sure it was a banner day for him. 
And, and this angel comes and says, Cornelius, you know, heaven has noticed your hunger for God and the heart that you have is amazing. And what I'm here to tell you today is to send to this town called Joppa. And Joppa was just a neighboring city. It would be like telling somebody to go to Eau Claire today, okay? But he said, go to Joppa and find this guy named Peter, and he's going to come and tell you words that you need to hear that will tell you how to have a relationship with God. So Cornelius got done, and, and he, he did just that very thing. He sent some people to, to uh, Joppa, and they found Peter. And simultaneously, just when these men came to Peter, Jesus came and appeared to Peter in a vision, and he told him, he says, listen, Peter, he says, don't call people unclean when I call them clean. What I've cleansed, he said, don't call unclean and you know when he was talking to Peter you got to read the story in Acts 10 but you know he got Peter's attention by talking to him about food you know how many know that food will get your attention food is so powerful that Dana and I have chosen not to watch Food Network in this season in our life because we found that when we watch Food Network the next thing we do is go to the refrigerator and so we said enough I can't chop it anymore you know, we got to do something new. And, and, and so Peter, Jesus talks to Peter about food and, and what he's eating and not eating. And then he brings it over into people. And he says, listen, there's people out there, basically, that need the gospel. And you may not think they're people you're supposed to go to, but I'm telling you, you need to go. So right when this is happening, the guys that Cornelius had sent come to Peter and say, hey, where's Peter? What I find so incredible, when people are on your heart and when you're following God, you go to talk to them, but you find out that God's already been talking to them. Isn't that amazing? That helps me so much when, when I have to talk to somebody about something and it's a big deal in my mind, but I pray about it and I go to them and I know this, that God is already speaking to their hearts. So it was with Peter. So, so Peter goes with these men and they come back to Cornelius' house. And this is kind of tagging from last week too where I talked about experience expanding our vision for influence. So what happened is when Peter got over to Cornelius' house, he says, he comes up, he finds Cornelius, but he doesn't just find Cornelius, he finds everybody that Cornelius could influence and grab and pull him into his house. People that were related to him, people that he loved, people that he cared about, and he says, we're all here waiting to hear what you got to say, Peter. We're here waiting. Yeah. There's hunger in the house. I love that, that Cornelius just didn't grab this stuff and hoard the gospel and say, well, I've got it. That's enough. Nobody else. The gospel is free, and it's to be given out. So Peter comes in, and he begins to preach, and I love this story. He began to preach, and right in the middle of his sermon, the Holy Spirit fell on the people in the house. It says that those that were in the house, just right in the middle, all began to pray in other tongues. And Peter says, Wow. This is like, just like it was for us on the day of Pentecost. God is doing something here. And can you believe it? He did it right in the middle of Peter's sermon. Which goes to show you, you don't always, pep preachers, have to finish your sermon for God to move. In fact, if God's moving, let it go. Let it go. Someone says, you need to get that, Pastor Paul. Oh, yeah. All right. So, so anyway, covenant. Covenant was extended beyond the Jews to the Gentiles, and it came through Cornelius. It came through Peter bringing the word to Cornelius. One quick story I want to tell you before we go. We're doing great. Time is on our side. And um, it's in 1 Samuel chapter 18. And again, I'm going to just tell you this story. I'll look to my notes so I don't forget any key points. But this is a story about David and Jonathan. In fact, I'm going to just tell you about the different people that are going to be in this story. There's David. Okay, David is a, is a, he's known as a giant killer. You guys remember David? Young shepherd boy, but he turned into a great warrior. And uh, he, could have, he could crush all his foes and the enemies of Saul. Bible says that David was also a man who was after God's heart. Let me back up a minute and tell you this. It didn't say that David was a perfect man. Okay, he was a human man. 
just like you and me, and he had faults. He had major gaping flaws in his life. But it says he was a man after God's heart. That means there's hope for you and me. Now, David, he loved Saul and had, his, had King Saul's best interest at heart. Saul was the king at this time. And at m- many opportunities, David could have killed Saul, uh, but he didn't. And David showed, he wanted to show great respect and love for Saul, but Saul, King Saul, wouldn't let David do it. So David is one person in the story. Another person in the story is this guy we just were talking about. His name was Saul. Saul was, was the king of Israel at this time, okay? And Saul, you know, he started out good, but he just took some bad turns, made some bad choices, and, and uh, he, he um, was basically, what I've got down here is he was basically the opposite of David. He was in pride, and he was seeking to do his own thing rather than obey God, and, and that's kind of how that stuff happens. You don't just turn bad one day. But there's choices along the way, and Saul made bad choices, and as he did that and followed that path, it hardened his heart towards God. You know, we don't want to do that, folks. We don't want to harden our hearts towards God. And you know what? We've all made bad choices, but that's why Jesus came. Jesus came so we could be free from bad choices, bad choices, free from every sin, and that's what sin is, is a bad choice. So Saul, uh, he's afraid of David, and Saul, King Saul, is actually obsessed with hunting David down and killing him. And Saul makes all of his family, you know, his, his sons and his grandkids, he makes them all afraid of David. He tells stories of how if, if, if David ever gets you, I'm telling you what, he'll whoop you upside one down the other, and he's going to kill you. This is the kind of stuff Saul would breathe out to his family. And, and so then there's another guy in this story. His name is Jonathan. Jonathan was one of King Saul's sons. And as it happens, Jonathan was quite the opposite of his dad. Where King Saul was, was in pride and, and anger and wanting to kill David, Jonathan, on the other hand, was, 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 was like David. And, and they became great friends. David and Jonathan became great friends. And they became more than just friends. They actually entered into, now important you hear this, they entered into a blood covenant. And if you read the chapter that I outlined here, you'll find it, it gives you great detail in some of the very uh, covenant rituals that we've talked about in weeks uh, past, like when Stanley and Livingston uh, were, were cutting covenant with people. David and Jonathan, you know, they exchanged gifts, they, they sacrificed, and they, they declared a covenant that covered not only them, David and Jonathan, but it covered all of their unborn children. Isn't that amazing? This covenant stuff, man, it reaches out beyond where you're at, and it affects people you love. So Jonathan, you know, was trying to make peace with David, uh, but his dad only stirred up rage, and uh, it only stirred up rage in his dad. And at one point, Saul even threw a spear at Jonathan, just like he had at David. So it, it angered King Saul. Now, one other, two other people I want to tell you about. One is a person named Ziba, a man who was a servant in Saul's house, and and uh, he's important later on in the story because he tells David about. Uh, a descendant of Jonathan that is alive on the earth that he can, he can bless. The last person in this story is a, is a man named Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth. Is anybody here named Mephibosheth today? Uh, if so, we'll call you Miff or something. I don't know. Mephibosheth. Um, so who is Mephibosheth? Mephibosheth was, was one of Jonathan's children. Okay, he's a young boy in this story. He's young. He grows to be older, but uh, he's a young boy who grew up in Saul's house. And if you remember what we said about King Saul is he hated David and really you get down to it. He was afraid of David and the things that he said about David were not true, but he told everyone that that if if, if David ever gets the chance, he is going to he's going to kill you. So he brought fear into his household about who David was, okay? So Mephibosheth is Jonathan's son, and he, he had an accident 
when he was young. Let me, let me go back and tell you this. Jonathan and Saul are killed in battle. They both die. You know, David loved Jonathan, and, and it wasn't a pleasant day for David to, to lose either one of them, but they both died. When that happened, David becomes the king. And when that happened, the, the members of Saul's household, including Mephibosheth, they fled for their lives, as it were. Why is that? Because they had been taught to fear David and what he would do if he ever had the chance. So in their, their scurry to get away from David, Mephibosheth has an accident. The, the person taking care of him is trying to get him out of the, the palace, and, and as they do it, he trips, and his feet, Mephibosheth's feet are crushed. He's a five-year-old boy when this happens. And from that point on, he was lame and didn't have proper use of his feet, okay? And so Saul and, John, or Saul and Jonathan have died. All of Saul's family have fled and David makes a declaration. He says, this, he says this to the people around him. He says, is there anyone left from Saul's house, from Jonathan's house, that I can go and bless? Ziba, remember Ziba? Ziba is the servant from Saul's household. Ziba says, yes, master king. He says, there is one person I know of whose name is Mephibosheth. He's alive, and he's in the land of Lodabar, okay? And, and, and he's, he's living today. His feet are lame, but he is alive. So David sets out to find Mephibosheth. Now, I guess the question I want to ask every one of you is this. In life, in this life that we live here on planet Earth, have you at any time ever felt like you're an outcast? Have you ever felt like, man, I'm just not in the cool crowd, you know? Or have you ever felt like, boy, I was, wrong, I was born in the wrong town. I was born in the wrong family. Have you ever felt like that? Mephibosheth felt like that. He felt like everything was against him from birth. He felt like, man, it's, been, it's, it's not fair. I, I, I've been set at odds with the, the, the king, with David. He, said, he felt like, wow, uh, who am I and, and, and what's going to happen to me? So let me ask you another question. In life, have you ever been taught something that you believed was true only to find out later that it wasn't true? Maybe about a person. Maybe about God. You know, maybe, maybe there's things you grew up believing about God, but then you're confronted with who he really is, and you realize that what you believed your whole life was wrong. Again, this is Mephibosheth, okay? So what happens? Here's what happens. David, he goes to Lodabar, and he finds Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth is in fear of David, but David, David takes him in. And what he does at that point is he restores to Mephibosheth, restores all that he lost as former grandson of the king. He gives him servants. And at this point, Mephibosheth's mind is being blown. His mind is being blown because this David, who all his life he'd been taught to fear, all his life he thought, oh, this guy, if he ever gets a hold of me, he's going to kill me. People have thought that about God. People have thought, man, if I ever get too close to God, you know, he's going to make me do something I don't want to do. He said, you know, if, he get, if I get too close to God, he's going to make me be a missionary in Botswana, and I don't want to go there. I heard one guy say he thought if he ever got too close to God, God was going to make him marry some girl in the church that he didn't like. And he said, and frankly, he said, I thought about it. I thought I'd rather go to hell than marry that girl. <laughs> anyway, I didn't say that. I'm just telling you what somebody else said. But, 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 you know, that's what people think. They think, if I get too close to God, my days of fun are over. So David comes to Mephibosheth. He restores to him all that he's lost. And get this. 
he goes the next step. He says, listen, from now on, Mephibosheth, he says, not only have you been restored everything you lost, but he says, I want you eating dinner with me every night. You're going to sit at the king's table, a place of honor, a place of respect, and you're eating with me. You know, David in this whole story is like a type of God, and we're like Mephibosheth. You know, we might have run from him, but God is seeking us. He's looking for us. Just like when Adam sinned in the garden, the first thing you find after that is, is God's coming looking for Adam. Not to beat him up, but to show him a path of restoration. David came to restore Mephibosheth. Jesus said this in, in Revelation chapter 4. You know, Jesus said this. He said, he said uh, behold, I, I stand at the door and I knock. He said, if any man hear me, he says, let him open his door and let him open his heart and I'll come in. And what will he do? He says, I'll sup with him. I'll sup with him. What does that mean? It means you've been invited to the king's table. Just for clarification, Jesus wasn't saying those words to the Gentiles. He wasn't saying those words to people out of the family, out of the kingdom. He was speaking to believers like you and me. He's saying, listen, this is my heart. This is what I desire. It's to have a connection with you. This is what I desire is that we could sit down and have fellowship together. Now, when I was growing up, my grandmother had a, had a, it was amazing. She actually had a picture of Jesus doing this. I don't know how she even got that. But it was a, a picture. I'm just kidding. She had a picture in her house of Jesus knocking on the door. And the thing about the door was this, that it only had a knob on one side, on your side and my side. Jesus won't bust through the door, but he stands there and knocks and says, hey, anybody, any one of my kids at any time, open the door, I'll come in and hang with you. You've been invited to the king's table. He wants to eat with you. Isn't that spiritual? Eating with the king, eating with him. I remember one time I was working a job. When we started this church, I was working a job in St. Paul. And, uh, you know, I had great freedom on this job. They just wanted me to be there to solve any crisis that happened, which didn't happen all the time. And uh, I actually tried to argue with my boss once and tell him he didn't need me. And uh, I tried to quit, and they ended up giving me a raise and cutting my hours and paying me more. I said, okay, let's try that again. No. <laughs> but, but I remember I was talking to Dana on my break one night, and I said, I said to her, I said, yeah, you know, I think I'm going to go pray as much as I can and, and have a couple cookies while I'm at it. And she said, oh, Paul, that's not very scriptural. Go eat cookies and pray. I said, sure it is. Jesus says, I knock at the door. If you open up, I'll come in and sup with you. So, hey, you know what? He likes chocolate chip. Thank you for listening to Liberty Christian Center's podcast. To partner with this ministry or for any additional information, please visit libertychristiancenter.org.